part of the wisdom that he wants to share today. Reverend Bob Hand. I'm not going to impart all of the wisdom because then I couldn't come back and talk. <laughs> there are three themes uh, this month. Apparently one of them's flow. I have no clue what the other one is. Uh, but source is one of them. And I figure if I cover that, I'll cover whatever the themes are. Acceptance. Oh, acceptance. Well, I accept that then. <laughs> okay. Um, but source, you know, when we think about source, we tend to think about uh, how do we use it to manifest things that we want in our life. But I think maybe we should go back another step because if we want to look at sort of how we make that connection, we first need to figure out what's our relationship with source. You know, our, our relationship as with people. We have different relationships with people that are defined within the society that we're in, and we have a relationship with source that must be defined somehow universally. And we search for that relationship through different paths. Some of us search through ancient writings, so we may be reading the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, the, the Vedas, all sorts of ancient writings, and we'll go back and read those and look for those clues in them to the wisdom of what's our connection with source. And many people do it through intuitive methods, so through meditation, through chanting, through certain rites, uh, that they're trying to make that intuitive <coughs> connection to figure out what their relationship with source is. And another way we can do it is by looking at the manifestations of source. Because if source divine source manifests something, then there must be some trail, some thread we can follow back to source itself. And so, of course, the primary manifestation of source is physical reality. So let's look at physical reality. I mean, obviously, it's right here. It's all around us. It should be simple to look at it and follow it back. <clears throat> the problem, of course, with physical reality is it isn't always what it seems. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you some things about physical reality here. I don't want anybody to get shocked. I don't want anybody to scream or faint. Uh, this is <laughs> the true world around you. The sky is not blue. Now, settle down. Don't get excited. This isn't going to hurt anyone. But, you know, we look at the sky, it's blue, obviously. And yet, it isn't. There is no big shield up there or, or tarp that's painted blue. We know that the light that comes from the sun has all wavelengths of color. It hits the atmosphere, it gets diffracted in a particular way. And so, the wavelengths that come to us tend to be primarily blue. And so, we see the sky as blue. We are more empty space than solid matter. If it was not for the electromagnetic forces within our body, and I clap my hand, my hands would go right through each other. The actual material matter within us is very minor. We're more empty space than matter. And so the, our perspective on physical reality defines a lot of what it is for us. So, like, I've used perspective to totally control reality. Now, I know this is going to sound <laughs> shocking, but you, you'll see when I do it, like, you look at me, and, and, I mean, I can tell, I look in your eyes, and I can say, you're thinking, wow, does Bob really look young? <laughs> <laughs> And, and so the way I did this, this manipulation of reality, I thought, you know, people think about the years that they grow, but, but you have to instead think about each day. And I thought, well, you know, if tomorrow never came, then I wouldn't be a day older. So I went into source, and, and I put that in mind, 
and went to bed and I woke up and sure enough, the next day I woke up, it wasn't tomorrow, it was today. <laughs> and I've been doing that ever since. <laughs> and tomorrow has never come yet. Now if any of you want to learn that technique, you can see me afterwards. It's a little tricky, but I, I can probably teach it to you. But. But, you know, when we look at physical reality, we want to think, well, there are some very set laws we can find, and we'll just apply those same kinds. If those physical laws are the, come from spiritual laws, then the spiritual law must be the same. And, and we want these very specific laws, such as gravity. And we say, well, gravity is totally non-personal. Gravity applies to everybody. It's very simple. And yet, of course, gravity is not very simple. Gravity is actually a very strange force like all of reality. It gets murky the more we study it, such as uh, we say that gravity is an energy. But Einstein's formulation shows that gravity is the warping of space and time, the actual bending of space and time, not an energy at all. And yet, um, gravity not only pulls things towards us, it slows down time. So if you're in the gravity on Earth, time will actually go slower than if you're up in space. Uh, the gravity in a black hole, you know, a black hole is a huge star that's collapsed. The gravity is so intense, it actually alters the physical laws of reality. Hmm. We, uh, it appears that dark matter actually acts as the opposite of gravity and repels things away and so that the universe is expanding faster than it should. And yet we don't really know that, nor do we know how it works. So it becomes very difficult to use this reality. It has so many apparent paradoxes in it. And yet, these very paradoxes can be what we look at to lead us to truth of source. It's the very paradoxes that physical reality creates that can lead us to truth about our relationship with source. And let's look at one of those very obvious ones we've talked about many times, if you'll go back to an earlier chapter when I spoke. We talked about matter and energy. Everything is both of those things. Energy is a wave that's spread over, and matter is a very solid thing in one spot. All electrons, protons, neutrons, and you could say even atoms, etc., are both matter and energy at different times. When are they one? When are they matter? And when are they energy? The only thing science has been able to show is that it becomes matter if we measure it in such a way that we are measuring matter. If we measure it in such a way that we're measuring energy, it will be energy. Now that's strange enough, but that's easy. I'm going to go back and talk about an experiment I talked about one time before. So we can take a beam of light and it will hit something, I'm going to call it a, a beam splitter. It hits this splitter and can go off both ways. Or it might not split and it may just go one way. Okay. So here comes a beam of light, it hits the splitter. Usually it will split, and we know that because when we measure it at the end, we can tell if it's energy or not, okay? So normally it'll hit that splitter, it'll split, go two ways, and end up back here. And we know it's energy because only a wave can go two different waves and come back. Now we can do something else. We can take a measuring device and we can put it there. So now we're going to tell which of those paths it took. If that measuring device is there, it will always only take one path. We will never measure it on both paths. So let's look at this. If we don't measure which path it's on, it always goes on both paths. And we can tell that at the end when we check it. 
If we do measure which path it's on, it'll always go on one path. <laughs> this is reality. Remember, these are the top physicists, the top scientists in the world that measure. But now comes the tricky part. We shoot that beam and the, the measuring device is turned off. What do we know it's going to do? It's going to go on both ways. But randomly, if we turn that measuring device on after it's already split, it will then be measured as being only on one path. So if the measuring device is not turned on, it always goes on both paths. If we turn it on after it's already gone past the splitter, it will only be on one path. Unimaginable. And yet, an experiment that is done over and over and over and shows the same results. Now, when I spoke about this before, the only theory people had was that somehow it affects the past. And so that the past is not solid. But I've read about another theory that I think can really lead us to understanding our relationship with source. In quantum physics, the study of, of small uh, particles, subatomic particles, the concept is everything has quantum potential. Quantum potential is the information about that. So an electron goes at a certain speed, always. That speed is its quantum potential. I mean, always within the vacuum. It vibrates at a certain rate. That's its quantum potential. If it's in a magnetic field because it's, it's a negatively charged, that's its quantum potential. It'll bend. So the quantum potential defines what something is at that given point. And everything has it. Obviously, human beings have tremendous quantum potential of all of the different uh, atoms and molecules that we're made up of. But what does this experiment tell us about quantum potential? That light beam has a quantum potential. If it splits, it's the potential of energy. If it stays as one, it's the potential of matter. But what this theory says is everything, not only its quantum potential, isn't defined by itself, it's defined by the whole system it's part of. So if it's in a system that measures energy, it will be energy. But even if it's already split and become energy, if the quantum potential of that system is changed that only allows matter, then the quantum potential of the beam changes so it becomes matter. It means that everything in the world, every electron, every proton, every neutron that we are made of is defined not only by itself, but by the whole universe around it. So what does that tell us about our relationship with source? It says that source is intimately integrated. Everything is part of everything else. Now we like that. We sing we are one. It's happy and it's joyful. But let's look. It just is. What does it mean? It means that we can affect everything. 